I want to bring in Dr. Sara Andravi now. She's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Baylor College of Medicine to chat a little bit more about this. So doctor, I want to start with this latest news on AstraZeneca and the vaccine efficacy there. It's on average, as Anjali was describing for everyone, roughly 70%. Uh, this is a lot lower, of course, than what we've heard from Pfizer, from what we've heard from Moderna, which is roughly 95% across them both. Uh, I mean, you are a doctor here. For someone like myself, I think, okay, well, that means the vaccine just isn't as good. I, I wouldn't want that vaccine as, as, at all. Uh, is that true? Does that make sense? Or, it, you know, is it like once you reach a certain threshold, it's okay, it's good to take? Yeah, thanks, Kristen, for having me on the show. Um, so we have some great news, right, in terms of projected vaccine effectiveness. We're seeing numbers as high as 95% efficacy. Uh, when Dr. Fauci said he would be happy at 75%, and the FDA said they would be happy with 60%. And this is eight months later, right? And for reference, pre-pandemic, eight years would have been considered speedy in terms of developing these vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine is showing 95% efficacy in about 44,000 participants. It needs to be kept really, really cold, like a deep freezer, and it's good for five days. The company has actually created its own GPS tracked coolers filled with dry ice to distribute it. But pharmacies and doctor's offices don't tend to have the types of freezers to store these. And the Moderna vac vaccine is showing 94.5% efficacy with about 30,000 study participants. It needs a freezer too, but one that most medical offices. This vaccine is good for up to 30 days. And most recently, AstraZeneca announced that its vaccine had a combined efficacy of 70% on an interim analysis. Um, so they're the earliest of all the studies, you know, and this study involves 12,000 participants currently. Um, this data is combining two different dosing regimens with one regimen that has 90% efficacy and another that has 62%. The 90% efficacy was shown when participants took half a dose initially and then took the full dose some weeks later. Um, and the phase three trials are ongoing in the U.S., and they may be shifting to this dose, so their data is still very early and could change. The benefits, though, with this vaccine is that it's an older technology, so it can manufacture much more in a smaller amount of time. In fact, AstraZeneca is promising to make more within the next year than Pfizer and Moderna combined. Um, it also can be kept at normal fridge temperatures, making it more accessible in both developed and developing countries. Sorry, doctor, I was totally muted. <laughs> like I could see your mouth being in the work from home uh, life. Um, so, so talk to me then. I know that we have to distribute this vaccine essentially to 300 plus million people inside the United States. So I, I know you just ran through some of the stats, some of the data for these vaccine. Is a 70% mm -hmm. efficacy rate still good enough then uh, to distribute to folks? I know that you mentioned that Dr. Fauci said he would be happy with a 75%. And I know when it comes to AstraZeneca in some of their trials, they actually were able to hit as high as 90%, depending on how they distributed the vaccine. Just wondering if you were to, if you had the AstraZeneca vaccine in your hands, you know, right now, would you say, okay, you know what, even with this average rate of 70%, this is still great enough to roll right. out to folks? Um, and so that's where I think like the different phases um, and also looking at like, what has worked so far is gonna come into play because they've done a few different modalities in terms of dosages. But when they look at that specific dosing of doing an initial half dose and then another full dose a few weeks later, that's where they're really seeing the 90% efficacy. So I see, I'd see that's where we, where we kind of go in terms of getting um, vaccinations done. But next steps would be looking into the logistics of distribution. You know, we have got to start looking at anything that can be done to expedite this transition so that Americans can get access to the vaccine when it's out. The first Americans to receive the COVID-19 vaccine could be immunized as early as the second week of December. And initially that supply is gonna be a lot less than the demand. It will be up to the states to define the high-risk groups to first receive that vaccine. So this could include frontline staff, at-risk individuals, um, elderly, nursing home patients. But by the time the general public gets a hold of it, it's probably gonna be springtime. So to get to that goal of 70% vaccinated, it'll be summertime at the least. 
And it's important to know that we need vaccination and not just vaccines. And health departments have limited staff, so they will have to figure out how to ramp up their staffing to administer vaccines and keep track of who's receiving them. And if we go down kind of the AstraZeneca route, where most of these vaccines are going to require two doses, so it's not just a one and done situation, it's going to be a massive public health undertaking to make this a reality. Let's switch now from the vaccine to the antibody treatment from Regeneron. It's the first to get that emergency use authorization, which for everyone at home essentially means that it hasn't gone through all of the steps, um, all of the rigor, for example, from the FDA that they would normally do in normal times uh, before they roll a treatment like this out. Are there any you know, question marks, any dose of skepticism in your head uh, before taking something like this or is it, do you think that if someone were to come into an emergency room and you know, has uh, coronavirus and has to have treatment that they are saying that they should probably take it um, and that it would be better for them to take this treatment uh, than to go without? Right. And I think that's where it gets back to looking at the data. You know, it's one of the experimental drugs that President Trump received while he was battling the coronavirus. And it's been approved for emergency use by the FDA. This is the second antibody treatment to win emergency use approval from the FDA. And this treatment combines two antibodies and administers them together by an IV. In a clinical trial of about 800 people, the combination was shown to be significantly reducing virus levels within days of treatment. Um, and the FDA made clear, though, that this drug is only for treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in people 12 years and older who are more high risk of developing more severe symptoms. It's not for patients who are hospitalized because of COVID-19, and it's not for patients who require oxygen therapy because of the virus. So you have to look at those kind of uses. Um, the emergency authorization of these antibodies administered together offers health providers another tool for combating the pandemic. So we are excited about that. Both this and the other FDA approved drug are synthetic versions of human antibodies that mimic the immune system's ability to fight off harmful pathogens. And so what they do is they bind to coronavirus and prevent it from invading cells. Um, and like you said, neither drug has yet gotten full FDA approval, which entails a much more rigorous review and takes a lot longer to complete. On Thursday, the FDA also granted emergency use authorization to varicitinib, which, when used with remdesivir, has been shown to be effective in battling more severe cases of COVID-19, the ones that do require hospitalization or that do require someone to be on a ventilator. Emergency use authorizations are granted during public health emergencies when a treatment could be effective. And people, right. you know, have gone to, like, that's why the president received this. You know, the CEO of the drug company said that he received a request to access this be and they weighed it very carefully against our established criteria for compassionate use, which is an FDA pathway meant for exceptional circumstances. So this is really important information that you're sharing uh, with us. And I'm, I'm glad because I didn't know all of those full details there, at least when it comes to the treatment. I want to ask you now about the holiday. I think it's something that everyone is thinking about Thanksgiving being this week, being able to see their family, being able to see their friends. Now, this is something that folks are saying, frankly, we really should not be doing right now. Wondering as you're seeing it, what are you anticipating? Again, you're in a, a you know professor of emergency medicine, so a lot of these folks probably would be coming in through the emergency room if they are experiencing trouble from the mm -hmm. virus. What are you anticipating and, and what are your fellow physicians anticipating in, let's say, three weeks from now after we have this holiday? people probably going to be out there flouting a lot of the rules because mm -hmm. we've seen it happen throughout the summer. And I know that coronavirus fatigue is at an all time high. What are you guys worried about and anticipating uh, the most for about a month from now? Yeah, so on Thursday, the CDC recommended against Thanksgiving travel by air and train, right? Um, despite officials cautioning against it, airports across the nation saw some of the highest numbers to date. I mean, just on Friday, security agents screened over a million passengers and then another million on Saturday. The CDC also says that most COVID infections are spread by people with no symptoms. And the weather is colder, so people are staying indoors. And as we know, viruses love to spread in these type of settings. And this is why our traditional viral seasons, like the flu annually, tends to be in winter months and not so much in summer. So it makes sense that the CDC is recommending against indoor gatherings with individuals outside of your household. Now, there are alternatives. They could include small gatherings um, by the outdoors, which I mean no more than 10 people at a time. You could get, and sorry, my 
my light went out, um, individually <laughs> packaged food items as well, and using in video modalities such as Zoom or FaceTime to see your loved ones. Many have said video chatting during the pandemic has helped them stay in touch with friends and family members who they otherwise wouldn't see. And I'm going to miss our annual Thanksgiving traditions, um, but I also want to be able to enjoy our traditions next Thanksgiving and for many Thanksgivings to come. So we'll have to pass on. In terms of your question, um, you know, for what we're going to see in Texas, I mean, the ICUs are being pushed to their limits. In Odessa, Texas, 35 to 45 percent of people getting tested are testing positive for COVID-19. Hospitals are sending patients with hypoxia or low blood oxygen home with oxygen tanks, something that could usually get you admitted to the hospital. Um, but right now, there's just no space in the hospital for those patients. In El Paso, Texas, one in every 24 people has COVID-19. El Paso has almost 50,000 new COVID infections in the past five weeks. Hospitals have been overwhelmed, and federal and state agencies have rushed additional medical personnel there. From more than 50 COVID deaths with another 450 under investigation. And deaths have mounted so rapidly that at least nine mobile morgues are storing bodies there. Yeah, yeah. And I say, yes, you know, we're front lines in the hospital, but to the public who is watching, you guys are front lines as well. When you go to the grocery store, you go out, wear a mask, practice hand hygiene, keep your distance from others. Please help stop the spread.